you. So I'm Ed Lancaster. I'm the, the Eurovella Director at the European Cyclist Federation. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this side event today. It's the collaboration towards seamless and safe cycling in the pan-European region and the role of pan-European cycling network. It's been organized, uh, it's a joint event organized jointly by the UNEC, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Confederation of the European Bicycle Industry, the WBIA, the World Bicycle Industry Association, and also ourselves, the European Cyclist Federation, ECF, with the kind support of the Austrian Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. Um, now, next week, the Pan-European Master Plan for Cycling Promotion will be formally adopted at the fifth high-level meeting of the PEP. Uh, three of the recommendations in that master plan relate to creating a user-friendly cycling infrastructure. And over the past 12 months, uh, our organizations have been working uh, on this, already started working on this infrastructure module, trying to realize, uh, start work on realizing the recommendations. So the purpose of the event today is to present what we've been doing to date, demonstrate how working on the pan-European level can complement and support the work being done on a national level, and also discuss how you can help with this work going forward. Um, if, if Alexander, if you could just go to the agenda for the day, for the morning. So I'm shortly going to be handing over some, for some opening words from Robert Thaler, the, who's, amongst other things, the chair of the PEP. We then have these three blocks. So the first block, we'll be going to be presenting the work that we've been doing so far on the infrastructure module. Uh, the second block, points three and four there, you can see we'll be looking at the national level and what can be done on the national level and also what is already being done. We've got some good practice examples there. And then last but not by no means least, we have the panel discussion where we have some esteemed guests to consider some of these, these big topics. Just, just in the way of some housekeeping points, I know we've been used to a year of doing these online meetings now, but this is perhaps a new platform for some of us. Um, we're going to be using the chat function. So if you if you have questions or comments, please use chat rather than Q&A, just so we have everything in one place. You can see that's on the right-hand side of your screens. Um, Anna is just going to be setting up a poll for us so we can get an overview of the types of people tuning in today, so we can have an overview of the types of uh, organizations you represent. So if you can have a look at the poll section just to um, and complete that so we have that overview. And then one final point for the speakers, as much as anything, we, as I say, we have quite a tight schedule today. So I do have a little bicycle bell. So if you hear that, it means your time is up. So please wrap up shortly after that. Uh, I'm afraid we, we don't have much uh, leeway between the times. So uh, I'm going to have to use that uh, when necessary. Um, yeah, so that's by way of introduction. I'm now very honored to hand over to Robert Thalo. As, as I say, he's the chair of the PET, but he's also the head of the Division for Active Mobility and Mobility Management at the Federal Ministry for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology in Austria. The floor is yours, Robert. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome from Vienna. Uh, unfortunately, only online, so you cannot um see how nice the weather today in Vienna is perfect weather for cycling I hope it's also there where you are I welcome you very warmly to this uh, side event uh, in fact uh, Vienna in these days is one of the most important places uh, regarding active mobility uh, as we are in the decisive phase for um, the, just ahead to adopt the first ever pan-european master plan on cycling which is a real milestone a historic milestone um, and I think it's very important to be aware of that we just um, have to overcome this uh, trap of subsidiarity what I always say so that the federal level says cycling promotion is up to the regions the region says up to the cities and the European level says up to the member states so and in fact uh, normally the local level is left alone and I think uh, the, the Pan-European Master Plan and also the all efforts of work and bundled together, um, the, the whole, um, the whole um, list of, of member states and institutions, um, industry, uh, cycling federation, UNEC, WHO working together has shown that there is an enormous interest in promoting active mobility. So we have reached now really a breakthrough it's not, uh, and I re when I compare the situation 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was for sports and fun and fantastic, but not for daily uh, purposes. And now we are really in the, in the phase of a breakthrough because we all know that for our urban areas, uh, 
active mobility, cycling, walking are perfect solutions adapted to human scale also of our cities. And uh, what we need, and therefore this, uh, this um, um, initiative is so important, what we need is also a European and a pan-European framework. A framework which supports uh, member states, which supports cities, which supports regions. And this is very important because this pan-European framework is, is till now not existing. We have infrastructure frameworks for nearly everything, from motorways, for railways, for airplanes, for inland shipping. Cycling was not there on this uh, radar. And now we are in this phase of changing. We have, uh, we are real, we are real making, we have with the master plan, we have something like a game changer. And I'm very grateful to, to the organizers of this webinar, especially to our colleagues in the UNEC, but also in Konevi and Cycling Federation, that it's now we are on the, we are in the real phasing in of a trans-European cycling network. And this would be an absolutely uh, incredible thing 10 years ago when we first proposed this uh, normal reaction was uh, laughing about this idea of what you think about trans-European cycling. Nobody could uh, imagine what that means. It was not easy to uh, raise the awareness and to convince uh, stakeholders, but now we are in the phase that everybody is convinced that we also need a pan-European framework and the master plan and also an infrastructure framework. And I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that we are now in this phase. Thanks a lot to you all. And uh, it's not the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story because we have to um, admit that we have we've faced a lot of problems with data gaps, with uh, geographic information system, with all this kind of stuff, with um, countries which have some networks, countries which don't have. So there's a big variety. And what we want to achieve with this initiative is that this, this uh, mosaic, which are now have just some puzzle stones, um, uh, will then get become a wonderful picture uh, so that it's easy to cycle from Lisboa to Vladivostok. With this uh, future uh, approach, I wish you a, a good webinar. And I hope that this is uh, the beginning of a real good journey to uh, promote active mobility all over Europe, not just in some places, but all over Europe. So thanks a lot for your initiative. Good luck. And uh, we will see, um, we, we will hope that the adoption of the Pan-European Master Plan is also a boost for this trans-European cycling network all over Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for those positive and inspiring words. A good, good way to start the, the session today. So as I say, this the first block we're going to move to now is looking at the work uh, our organize, organizations have done to start already start to look at this infrastructure module. So and we've started to identify what we consider the prerequisites for seamless and safe cycling on the pan-European uh, throughout the pan-European region. Uh, so firstly, my colleague uh, Alexander Buczynski will be presenting the regions, the reasons and benefits of taking a harmonized approach to infrastructure, infrastructure design standards and road signs. Then Anna Schurer from Conobi WBIA, uh, Lukas Varoski from UNECE and myself will present the work that's been done at trying to identify the actual infrastructure that's currently on the ground uh, and some of the good practices that are out there. Um, and so over to you, Alexander, to kick things off. Thank you, Ed, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, when we talk about uh, cycle networks, the first thing that usually comes to mind are cycle tracks uh, designated for cycles and separated from other roads or other parts of the same road by structural means. Uh, this uh, definition and science for cycle tracks, uh, they have been agreed internationally in 1968 in the conventions on road traffic and in the Convention on Road Signs and Signal. Another type of cycle infrastructure that was uh, agreed then is a cycle lane, a part of a carriageway designed for cycles and distinguished from the rest of the carriageway by horizontal road markings, but it's just painted on the road. But this was agreed more than 50 years ago, and since then, many other types of cycle infrastructure emerged. For example, one example of such infrastructure is Cycle Street, uh, a carriageway where bicycles mix with motorized traffic, but are, are somehow prioritized. I will get back 
uh, to what does it exactly mean in a minute. But when preparing the infrastructure module for the Pan-European Master Plan for Cycling, we looked at 14 different solutions or network components to check how they are defined, signed and applied in different countries. And uh, one of the first things that we have found out is that not all the solutions are available in all countries. There are quite a few states that don't have yet provisions, for example, for contraflow cycling, for cycle streets, or even simple way finding signs for cyclists. Second, the components that were included in the Vienna Convention 50 years ago, they are understood and signed more or less the same across Europe. But the newer inventions, even if they stem from a common idea, again, cycle streets, they introduce different rules of the road in different countries. Often you have the same or a very similar sign that uh, means different things in different countries. And this does not make it easy, for example, for visitors to abide by local uh, rules. So it's good that cities uh, and countries experiment and develop new ideas, but at some point it's also good to come together and try to harmonize them. Third and final point, even if you cons only consider the most basic forms, such as uh, cycle tracks known for 50 years, many countries still don't have proper design standards for them. Often it's simple dangerous to use uh, the cycle tracks that have been built. For example, here you can see that the drivers exiting the parking have no chance of seeing the approaching bicycle. So there was political will to do something for cyclists. There was money, uh, but because, because of lack of technical know-how, it was wasted on infrastructure that is not used or not safe to use. But if the cycle infrastructure is done properly, it gives a very high return on investments. And uh, the other speakers uh, in this uh, short session will show you some ideas uh, how to achieve that. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, Alexander. So uh, I mentioned in my introduction that there are several recommendations in the master plan that's being adopted next week related to infrastructure. Recommendation 3.1 is to develop or expand the methodology and monitor implementation of a trans-European cycling network. And the good news is there is an existing uh, network, European Cycle Route Network, which can form as a, a basis for that. That's the Eurovelo network. This may be familiar with for some of you. It doesn't cover the whole UNECE region yet, and it only, it's only the, Euro, the European level cycle routes. It doesn't go down to the national regional level, which is the ambition for this work we're doing now. But nevertheless, it gives us a good framework to, to build our work on. It was established back in 1995. We now have 17 routes that make up the network, going through 42 different countries. And when complete, it will cover over 90,000 kilometers. So it's already quite an extensive network that makes it the largest cycle route network in the world. Um, importantly, it's based wherever possible on existing or planned national cycle networks. So we're not creating brand new routes for the sake of it. Wherever possible, we're using existing networks. Um, we estimate, according to figures from last year, 60% of it is already developed. So that's about 50 over just over 50,000 kilometers. And over 33,000 kilometers have the Eurovelo, distinctive Eurovelo, unique Eurovelo route information panels up. So it's already signed with Eurovelo signs. So this is a good basis we can work on. ECF coordinates this network on the European level with a network of national coordination centers who are responsible for developing it on the national level. Um, if we move to the next slide, Alexander, you can see that the Eurovelo network can form the backbone for much more denser national, regional and local networks. And you can see that work done on a local, regional and national level can also contribute to the European level in the same way that the work we're trying to do on the European pan-European pan level can also benefit the, the other tiers by providing this backbone and this basis for the other networks. So we think this is a, a good framework to begin with. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Anna, who's been looking at what's being done on a national level uh, across the region. Yeah, thank you very much, Ed. Um, so we've been working, as already explained, over the past year 
on how can we develop a pan-European cycling network. And as I already said, we don't have to start from scratch. We already have good practices that we can share. There's on the one hand the Eurovelo, which was just explained in more detail, but there's already cycling networks developed at the national level, which we looked at to define the best practices. And based on that, see, okay, what are some of the requirements of a good cycling network, which I will briefly talk about right now. So the first point here is coherence and integration of the network, both across cities and transport modes, meaning that a, a cycling network doesn't just stop once you get to the end of a region, but it continues because of good cooperation. And also that the different transport modes are interlinked to really allow for multimodal transport journeys. So you can start uh, your cycling journey anywhere you would wish to. Next is signage. This is also very crucial, especially if you're talking about cycling tourism and cycling in areas that are less familiar to you. So it's important to know where you have to turn and which are the next big cities around. Then regular maintenance. Here, this is uh, relevant for everybody, but particularly relevant if you're talking about cycling networks for commuting, because there cyclists might use this network not just when the weather is nice outside like today, it's sunny, it's dry, but also if it's more windy, if there's snow on the road, so that's important. Then going back to the word cycling tourism, you want to look at, okay, what are the additional services that could be offered along the network? And here we're talking about accommodation providers, restaurants, bike rentals, and repairs. And then closely connected to the first point is well thought out coordination and development of the network. So already when planning the network, when planning individual routes to see where does it make sense to build them? Do you already have an existing network you can base it on? And what are the aspects to consider? And last but not least, the promotion of the cycle network. You can have a great network, but you might just not know about it. So that's an important aspect that all authorities should take into consideration. Next slide. So uh, now I would like to briefly explain three best practices, highlight them in the report. And then also later on during this webinar, we'll see some more best practice examples really from experts in the field who have been developing national cycling networks. The first example here is from Belgium, in particular Flanders that have been developing a number of cycle highways to connect major urban areas to facilitate both commuting and leisure cycling. And there's two especially relevant aspects about this network that I would highlight, like to highlight. One is the good signage, which you can see, for example, on the right side of the slide here, that there's these panels all along the route, so you know which cities are ahead. And also it's very easy to detect where you have to turn and also when a dangerous crossing might come where you have to pay particular attention. And another relevant aspect is the maintenance of the route, because as I mentioned, this network is also built for commuting. So people want to be able to use it all year round. So it's also being cleaned up. That's particularly relevant. Next slide, please. Another example is France, uh, where a national cycling network is currently developed together with Vélo et Territoire. And there the plan is to have a national cycling network of more than 25,000 kilometers. And the routes are built based on specifications made at the French ministerial level. So there's already some considerations into the infrastructure, how it's supposed to be built. And what's particularly relevant is that in France, they build up so-called itinerary committees for each route that is being developed to put together experts of the area and decide where should the route go, what needs to be built, what can be repurposed, and how do we want to establish it with additional services and so forth along the route to really have the best possible and most coherent network available. Last but not least, an example from Spain, which might not be known as a big cycling country, but I really like this example of taking old train tracks that are no longer in use and repurposing them for bicycle uh, tracks, but also for walking. And here, there's a network of Vias Verdes spanning almost 3000 kilometers and the very interesting aspect is that it's not just the train tags that have been reused, but they also looked at, okay, what are old infrastructure buildings around? What are old railway station that can be repurposed to offer um, restaurants, hotels, so that also the local economy is directly supported by these developments. And now I would like to hand over to Lukas, who will explain to you where we already at towards a pan-European cycling network. Well, I'll step in. We'll get so far. Apologies for that. It doesn't. You not can't seem to hear you. So the idea was to try and get an overview of um, the current infrastructure that's out there on a European and also the national and even a regional level, if possible. So last year, 
uh, our organization started reaching out to the member states throughout the, the UNEC region to try and collect this information. I don't know if, uh, Alexander, can you click on the, the, the link? We can, we can perhaps have an overview of the data that's been collected so far. So we received back quite a lot of information, as you can imagine, about the, the Eurovelo routes, but also some of the national cycle networks as well. And uh, UNEC have created a platform, a GIS platform, to collect this information. And that is available, um, which we were going to show you. Maybe Alexander can show you now, uh, putting him on the spot here. But in any case, we, we've now managed to collect quite a lot of information. We're still missing some of the, the GPX tracks of, of national and regional routes. So this partly, one of our pleas today was that uh, if you're responsible for this type of information in, in your country or your region, please get in contact with us and help us to put this together. You can see here, this is the, the GIS platform and we do have some of the existing routes in there. The, the orangey colors, I think, are the European routes, the Eurovelo routes, whereas the green are the, the more denser national, in some cases, regional and local networks that we've had access to. So I think that's that's enough, Alexander, if we, <laughs> if we go back to the, the slides again. Ah, Lucas, can, can we now hear from can you? Can you hear me now? We can hear you now, yes. You're back in time for oh, the conclusions. Okay. So I can hand over to you for that. <laughs> Apologies, the computer, the computer is um, working very slowly and the, even unmuting myself, it seems like the system did not want to appreciate this. Um, thank you, thank you Ed for taking over and, and uh, again apologies. Uh, just a couple of uh, more that that uh, Ed was uh, speaking a little bit too. Um, as you could see, we, we, we managed to collect uh, um, information on uh, from countries on the national networks it's all the time work in progress on the map you could not really see the network in Belgium but this is work in progress we have the data also we received data from Austria so they the, this is being integrated what's of course really important is that we will be receiving data from all the countries in the UNECE region so again you could see as for the euro velo network that is pretty much focused on the kind of eu part of the UNEC region but we also have to remember of course of the countries in caucasus central asia and of course uh, um, uh, the balkans now a couple of takeaways uh, if you if you allow me so um, when we had Alexander speaking at the beginning, he mentioned a couple of different components and new road uh, signs that are being developed for the cycling networks. And we have to acknowledge that, that these are independent developments in the countries. Now, we have to remember about two issues, comfort and safety. If we have components that, that actually um, kind of can be thought, oh, um, um, is this how I should behave as a cyclist? Uh, but as a matter of fact, the rules prescribe something different that possibly might not be good for your comfort, that might even be worse for your, for your safety. So that's something to remember about. Now, when we are working towards establishing the um, pan-European infrastructure module, we of course do take into account the good practice Anna spoke a little bit about the good practice. We will have more presentations uh, from other countries on what is the good practice in developing um, national cycling, cycling networks and what um, in the countries they do take into account. Um, yes, we spoke about the components. We believe harmonization will be important so that when we talk about a component like a cycling street that Alexander made a um, well, focus about. Um, we, of course, uh, need to, 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 to believe that, that, that we have the same understanding what's behind a cycling, cycling street. So here I would like to underline and stress again these two, two keywords, comfort and even more safety. So please remember, we are not doing it um, because we believe it's important. We do it because comfort and safety is something that, that we believe is important, very much important for, for cyclists. Um, Robert, in his opening remarks, mentioned that a couple of years ago, while there were different frameworks for all the other modes, it was 
difficult to 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 agree or even start believing that one could start working on something on a framework that will be for cyclists. Um, well, this is now something that we are trying to 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 work on. We we want to have definitions for the components. We want to have international design standards for the cycling in infrastructure. We believe that will be of helpful for the countries. This is what we as the organizer of the side event, of course, believe, but uh, we look forward to have more conversation with you on this. Um, we uh, elements that, 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 um, that, that we have all spoken about are important basis for the infrastructure module. Again, we are happy to have a conversation with you about this. Now, um, Thank you, thank you, Ed. Uh, I, I, I do take it that there were some technical problems, so I allow myself 30 more seconds. On the way forward, how we see it as the, as the, as the three organizations, uh, um, how do we see the way forward? We would like um, the, the process to, to work on the definitions and the universal application, so the harmonization here is the keyword, is started. Um, in these different side events, what is being referred to is the master plan for cycling promotion that I think uh, all the participants of the various side events and the participants of the next week high level event are hoping that will be, will be adopted. And that, as Robert mentioned at the beginning, will be a great game changer. This work that we want to have on the harmonization process of the definitions is in support of the recommendation um, 3.3. So one of the recommendations of the 33 recommendations that you have in that document. Um, what's important, you have seen the map. We want to engage with all the pan-European countries. As you could have seen, we have engaged in with, 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 with a few or, a, or already a good number, but there are many more. And so we would want to engage with you in developing the pan-European infrastructure module for cycling, of course, starting with collecting the data on your national networks or if you don't have yet national networks on the plans for the national for the national networks and this work is again in support of recommendations and we have two recommendations uh, uh, with referring to it at 3.1 uh, and 3.2 with this at over to you thank you very much so we're good. So I, I did feel bad about ringing the bell because I knew you had the technical problems but we do have to move on now so the, the second block uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at the national level. And hopefully you got the message there. We think the work we're doing on this pan-European level is going to complement and support the level that's being done on the national level. And we'd like to start by looking at uh, a guideline that's been developed to help def define and develop national cycle route networks. And so I'm going to give the floor to Andreas Friedwagner from Vericom. But he's also been playing a very uh, important role in putting together the, the PET master plan. So I'm very uh, happy to hand over to Andreas with this overview of the this guideline. So you, are you there? Here you go. Excellent. Thank you very much for allowing me to the moderation panel. Um, thanks for the introduction. Yes, we did actually have quite some work together on the Pan European Master Plan. Uh, but today I, I'm sharing an experience that is coming from a different uh, project. Um, I hope you can see my slide already. Can you? Not yet. No. Okay. Because I would like to talk to you about a project, the Danube Cycle Plans project that, um, sorry, that is aiming at developing national cycling plans and route networks. Okay, is that? We see it. Okay, excellent. Um, and route networks for uh, nine countries of the Danube region. Um, yes. And this project, uh, Danube Cycle Plans, has three objectives. So besides developing national cycling plans and awareness raising activities, we are about to define a Danube Cycle Route Network, infrastructure standards, and adequate financial support. And this is 
where the guideline comes in that I would like to present to you. Um, I, I have to say that this is not uh, something I've been preparing. I'm just coordinating the whole transnational project. This is the work of uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure of the Republic of Slovenia. And uh, they've been trying to put together actually the good practices that were available um, and uh, also taking into account the experiences that they made of uh, when, ex when developing their own national cycle route network. And I think uh, Gregor Stekovic will actually go into details as far as this good practice is concerned uh, in the next presentation. So what we have now is a guideline that is available for everybody. So if anybody is interested, we can share it with you, uh, which is more or less based on uh, seven steps that you should actually go through on your way to a national cycle route network. First will be defining methodology. This is very much thinking about what should be the focus of your network, uh, which good practices are in place, uh, how is the, the legal situation in your country. Then you are actually having a look at state of the art. So how does the network at the very moment look like? You do an analysis um, depending on the competence of your institution together, in, in many cases together with other uh, stakeholders from the regional, from the local level. Then you uh, define network criteria. Um, so this is very much about for whom are you planning uh, this network, for daily commuters, for leisure, for tourism, cycling. So this uh, network will also have uh, different levels, uh, like the transnational level, connections between regional centers, maybe connections to public transport, uh, connections to touristic uh, hotspots. Then you uh, can work on the first draft of your cycle route network. Um, that gives you a picture of how this network could look like in form of desire lines. But with that, actually, you are in a position to start a negotiation process of public consultation. Because this is a very important issue to not only define it from um, a bottom, uh, from top-down approach, but to involve all the stakeholders so that you actually have a wider acceptance of the, of the network at the very end. And this brings you into position to start detailed planning. So looking where these design lines could be actually in practice. So where are is existing infrastructure available? Does this infrastructure fulfill the criteria defined? Do I need additional new infrastructure built or can I maybe for temporary use um, use other routes that uh, help me to overcome my deficiencies that I have at the very moment in the network? And very important also follow-up activities, so providing um, guidelines, defining responsibilities, also this issue of maintenance is a very important issue as has been already uh, brought up in the presentations before. So what we are aiming at is actually contributing to the map that has been displayed um, by Ed at the beginning. So this is a, an older version of this map. Uh, there are already additional um, networks that have been uh, integrated. Um, we are trying to actually bring in the networks of uh, the nine uh, countries that are participating in our project. So that's Czech Republic, um, maybe an update, the uh, Slovak Republic, but also Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, uh, Croatia, um, and you've seen Slovenia and Austria is already included. So this is what we are aiming at. We are trying to do that by the end of 2022. Uh, so still within the framework of uh, the master plan, which aims at having these networks defined by the end of 2030. And we are just starting an activity of coming up with the minimum standards for cycling infrastructure. And we are also hoping to uh, directly engage in the standardization process that, is, um, that has been kicked off also by the infrastructure module of the Pan-European master plan. So I'm hoping for a lot of uh, interesting negotiations and discussions. In case you are interested in the guideline, please let me know. I'm happy to share that with you. Thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, thanks for the overview of the guideline. In fact, we're now going to switch to one of the, the authors of, of that guideline. He's going to give us an overview of what's being done, a good practice example on a national level. And that's Gregor Steklicic. If he's there, I, I just seem to be on the call. Is he there, Gregor? Maybe he, we can, it looks like maybe he was in a, he was taking another call. So maybe we can switch around these two examples because we, we do have two examples on a national level. So we can travel a little bit further north geographically and go to Hungary. And we're, I can see we are joined by uh, Miklos Berenski from the 
um, Center of Development of Active and Ecotourism in Hungary. So Miklos, thanks very much. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning for everyone. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so just, uh, I'm going to speak about the infrastructure, uh, planning and maintenance and signage, the rest areas and governments and coordination and funding. So this is what is necessary, I think, uh, in order to, to improve a network, a national network, and also uh, to integrate, integrate it in, uh, in the European network. So you saw this uh, um, pyramid before, and on the top of that, the European routes, the Eurovelo routes. We also have the national network, a regional network, and also local network. And you can see some examples on the right of the screen. Uh, if you see, if you check it, um, uh, the, the width of the, the cycle pass is, is uh, narrow if you go down. Um, Regarding the Eurovelo routes, uh, we have uh, four Eurovelo routes. Uh, uh, three of them is, is, is let's say, done. And uh, the last one, the Eurovelo 14, is under construction. But a part of it is already signed, posted, and can be uh, used. We are very proud of them. And, of, uh, of course, uh, we, we develop them uh, further. Uh, yes. Um, regarding the national level, uh, we have the national, national uh, spatial plan and the national, national uh, cycling network is uh, in in this act uh, so we have uh, the the main uh, routes designated and when we designate uh, we use a top down and a bottom up approach uh, in order to take into account the local circumstances uh, but we also would like to focus on on, on cross national uh, routes and in order to uh, touch the, the most important uh, touristic areas uh, and we also have to combine the different uh, demands of uh, commuting cyclists and touristic uh, or recreational uh, cyclists. Uh, this network is around uh, 6,500 kilometers long, uh, will be when it's going to uh, be ready, fully ready. Uh, it's not yet, but uh, we do the, the development uh, through the country. And we also have uh, some regions uh, which, uh, which have a, a priority regarding tourism uh, and also uh, cycling tourism. So uh, this is the, the yellow ones are the ones that we are working uh, right now in order to, to, in, uh, to develop the infrastructure and the services uh, as well. But we also gonna have uh, uh, like ten more uh, cycling tourist regions uh, to develop in the future. Um, this is just an example on a county level uh, network plan. It's from uh, Bács Kiskun um, County, uh, and you can see here uh, the, the 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 local uh, network, the local routes uh, as as well. Uh, this is a good example because uh, they have in this country in the south of uh, Hungary uh, uh, two uh, Eurovelo routes. Uh, one is uh, here and another one is there. So it's a good combination. Then you can see how the national uh, network elements and the European network elements are integrated into a county level network plan. Uh, regarding the, the, the design of the routes, uh, we have a national design standard and manual. It's based on the, the Dutch, uh, the Danish and uh, German uh, good practices. The principles uh, are the same, of course, safety, comfort, connectivity, directness, uh, cohesion, attractiveness and unbroken flow. And on the right of the screen, you can see a table uh, where you can take into account the, the speed and the, the traffic flow of the cars, and you can choose uh, the right infrastructure uh, element. Uh, the green is the shared uh, space, and uh, the blue one is the, the cycle uh, lane, and the orange one is the cycle pass. And we also introduce uh, the comfort level of the cycling routes. Uh, so you can define uh, the comfort of the route uh, by the user. 
So uh, the top uh, user is all the cyclists, including glitz, early people, disabled people, and uh, uh, that's the, the main uh, goal is to design and build uh, a cycle infrastructure for, for this user group. And if you go down, uh, you can find the, the last uh, and most experienced um, user group is the, the messengers or the pro racers, and they don't need such a good infrastructure, but uh, we don't really focus on them. Regarding the maintenance, uh, in Hungary, the local infrastructure is maintained uh, by the local municipalities. Uh, sometimes they have lack of funds and lack of uh, uh, experience. Uh, so the quality is at the moment is a bit uh, low of these uh, uh, roads. Um, but we decided uh, five years ago uh, to, to have a contract with the Hungarian public roads and the national uh, uh, sections of the network are maintained uh, by this state-owned uh, company. And they have an annual budget and they have technical standards uh, to do a proper maintenance uh, job throughout the, the country. They cover uh, 1,200 kilometers uh, at the moment and this number is increasing year by year. We also have a national standard for the signage uh, you can see on, on the right uh, the two different uh, two different uh, uh, size uh, of the the root panel. We also have information tables uh, with the same design, and we use uh, quite a lot uh, of these uh, designs. Uh, not only when we build new infrastructure, but also when we designate uh, cycling routes on existing infrastructure like uh, low traffic public roads, uh, forestry roads, dams, etc. Uh, we also have a manual uh, national level for the rest areas. Um, uh, these uh, design plans were done by an architect uh, studio and uh, these uh, plans are uh, free uh, for all of the municipalities uh, who would like to, to build um, a cycling route, including uh, a rest area. So they just uh, have to download uh, the plans and, and have the permissions and uh, they can contract uh, someone who would build it. Um, we try to use uh, quality materials uh, in order to make uh, the rest area uh, durable uh, with low maintenance uh, costs. Regarding the government, uh, governance and coordination, um, we have a cycling coordination department within the Ministry of Innovation and Technology. Uh, this is the ministry which is responsible for transportation. And their role is the legislation and to, to uh, create the standards, which I mentioned before, and they also uh, responsible uh, uh, for the funds and, and they uh, redirecting the funds for the different actors. Uh, including um, municipalities or, or local companies who are responsible for the construction of the national network sections. Uh, we also have a government commissioner uh, for active tourism and recreation, and uh, he ensures uh, the high level political uh, commitment and lobby uh, for cycling. So I think it's an important role. Um, and we also have the Center for Development of Active and Ecotourism. This is the, the, the agency where I work. And we are responsible for cycling tourism. And we, um, in the middle of creating the new uh, cycling strategy uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, we also have a very close cooperation uh, with the NGOs. Uh, they provide expertise uh, uh, when we develop or, or network. And of course, we, uh, we communicate uh, and cooperate with the ECF uh, for the Euro, uh, Euro Valley routes. Um, for funding, um, we used quite a lot of money uh, in the last uh, EU period and we plan to use uh, the same level for uh, the next period. And in order to summarize, just I can say that it's really important to have uh, a good national network and good national standards. And based on this, 
and taking into account the, the, the European good practice, uh, it's important to have the pan-European master plan and, and, and uh, the standards uh, for the infrastructure, for services, uh, and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Miklos. Thank you. Um, I think Gregor, we've got Gregor back, so we can go to, to Gregor to get the, the Slovenian example. If, if you could keep it relatively quick, five, five minutes or so, Gregor, that would be appreciated. So we have time. <laughs> Sorry about that. I've had various sort of technical issues uh, this morning. So I'll hand over now to Gregor, who's from the Sustainable Mobility and Transport Policy Directorate of the Ministry of Infrastructure in Slovenia. Now I think that you can see my presentation. Okay, you can see. So uh, I have to be quick. I will just try to explain what happened in the last five years and uh, what are the old challenges uh, in the Slovenian uh, cycling network. Yeah, oh, okay, no. I'm going to uh, this one. So the cycling officer was appointed, the new employees at the ministry uh, that are dedicated to implement and supervise cycling policies. Uh, and the projects uh, were uh, employed and the National Rural Prohibition Center was founded last year. So some legal acts was adopted, uh, awareness uh, raising activities, and uh, I think that uh, the major point that uh, I boomed the cycling infrastructure and the cycling development were financial resources. Uh, and but I just go back to the how we would uh, define the, our <clears throat> national cycling uh, uh, route network. Uh, and there was a target research project where they, uh, from 2015 to 2017, they elaborated the model to define national cycle routes. Uh, and first start, they started with the status quo analysis. And this is the, how to say, uh, the, uh, the infrastructure that we have in 2017. Uh, the main challenge was that there were no existing database on cycling infrastructure, and this is done by the a lot of uh, stakeholders involved, and each of them have to uh, prepare the documents uh, as you are preparing now for the pan-European uh, network. You can see a lot of missing things, incoherent network, and the standards are, are sometimes also questionable. Within the project, they prepared also the plan of the cycle route uh, of the long distances and definitely also for the main cycling uh, connections. So here you can see this map and on the right corner you can see also the map where should the temporary uh, uh, route goes because uh, not all the infrastructure is safe enough to guide the cyclists on the on that how to say, heavy heavy traffic uh, load uh, uh, routes. But uh, the compromise at the end, when we defined uh, our rules, a legal act is that was adopted in April 2018, was that we just create the corridors which, where should uh, uh, each level of uh, cycling connection or cycling routes goes. Okay. And because uh, we have no region, all the regional connections are part of the uh, national network. The green lines are the national, uh, local, uh, regional. Uh, but when we just uh, want to focus on the European level, uh, this is a long distance, the red one, and we have three euro yellow routes on the, just on the right corner of Slovenia in a hand, uh, hat, you, you, we have euro 13, on the coast we have euro uh, 8, and then we have from, uh, from, uh, from Maribor to Copper, which is uh, from North uh, east to southwest it goes the euro level nine. This is the uh, still the question how we're going to go. Um, and we did some uh, uh, improvement also in the new traffic sign for wayfinding that was uh, implemented in the rules and traffic sign and equipment. We uh, elaborated the guidelines. This is more strategic document for the municipalities how to uh, strategically approach and what to connect. Then we define the technical standards. This is it was officially uh, adopted before were just kind of instructions by, by our national uh, infrastructure agencies. And but this was the official legal act how to traffic uh, designers should uh, 
should uh, plan the uh, cycling infrastructure. And then, as I said, a lot of uh, investments are uh, were and are planned by the end of this financial perspective. This is few. Uh, yeah. This is few. Uh, this is a few uh, say measures how we dedicate the money to our national agency, to our regional uh, development agencies, and also to our municipalities. And uh, our average. That is, uh, in the last five years, it should be 30 million per year per 1 million inhabitants. Uh, what was cofinanced? A different uh, cycling infrastructure, uh, and this is also this. I think the most, uh, how to say, most money goes to the regional development agreement project. This is the cycling connections uh, in the vicinity of the uh, urban center, or um, so uh, smaller and bigger cities in Slovenia. That sh uh, should uh, their purpose should be the daily mobility, and we just uh, uh, use sometimes the existing roads with the traffic calming measures should be installed there. Uh, this is the plan that was uh, the routes that uh, should be built by uh, the uh, suggestions of the project proposals yes, yes. that were again in 2018 and. Applications that was uh, uh, the deadline was at the end of January, and uh, I will just show the differences. This is a bit shorter because the amount of uh, investments raised and they just shortened the length of the connections, and some connections uh, were uh, preparing for the next financial perspective. Uh, here I have the because we don't have the how to co current network, we decided just to uh, signpost some. Uh, track some routes that are already, how to say, that could be safe enough to cycle and to have the connected uh, connection from the start to the uh, to the end from the border pro uh, and cross the border into the other country. Uh, are, okay, I'm going faster because I think that the main point is uh, at the end. And before Alexander shows the shows the map of the European uh, uh, track of the Eurovelo and the Avril 9 is really missing and here we have the death, that challenge and we have some sections that are not uh, that must not meet the sa safety and could not meet the safety at the moment we have a lot of proposals and this is a test of our national coordination center our national coordination center was founded last year we have uh, three subgroups and I think the short-term priorities are this coordination of the route, and we also prepared two guidelines. First is the criteria for aerial route standards in Slovenia. Uh, it's adopted uh, ECF standards for Eurovelo, a bit uh, for Slovenian case, and then we're also preparing the minimum standards for macadam routes, uh, ma uh, maintenance, use for cycle routes. Um, so, and the midterm goals for the ministry and what could be do, done and should be done is uh, first is the national database on cycling infrastructure that is a project in uh, progress and the uh, database will be finished by the end of this year by the end of 25 we are gaining the co uh, coordinator tracks of all routes it should be within the Danielson uh, cycling plans we are preparing the national strategic plan and we are adopting and preparing a comprehensive central planning act that also includes uh, Cycling in the spatial planning that uh, was shown by Nicholas before. Uh, I think that that is already the time to re revise the technical standard uh, for cycling infrastructure. Uh, and here would be helpful to have uh, the sometimes international standards to easier implement some uh, new options that are uh, in uh, more developed uh, cycling countries already. Uh, we all all time we are just uh, trying to uh, affect the the laws that uh, are tackling to cyclists uh, with the uh, limited limitation this is mainly agriculture lands forest water and spatial planning and uh, one of the biggest texts in our the book the financial resources for the next perspective and to build a, a cycling network in slovenia and we think this is really important that uh, we uh, continue with the workshops uh, and education, especially we, we find out that the traffic infrastructure designers and at the end, the construction site managers, such as the workers that are 
at the finish of a, uh, how to say, build the constructed uh, cycling uh, tracks and cycling uh, infrastructure. It's really important. Uh, and by the end, I think that we, uh, because this, um, we are going to sign, signpost uh, the cycle routes that will not, uh, you know, how to say, will not meet all the standards. I think we we have to do the auditing and evaluation of all of it, and from that, uh, the major priorities and the uh, investment for improvements of our national cycle routes network. Thank you. Thank you, Gregor. Sorry for rushing you there. It's a lot, a lot to get through. And very impressive. Um, I think you'll all agree the, the work that's been done both in Slovenia and also in Hungary. We heard from Miklos earlier. And in both cases, it's interesting they're taking a cross sectorial approach. So it's not the public's working with the private sector with the NGOs. It's a collaborative approach, which I think is, is bearing fruits in both cases. So thank you both for that. I'm now going to hand over for the, the final session to Anna and Wukas, who are going to uh, moderate the, the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Ed, for your great moderation skills. As of our, um, we are still missing one panelist, Bob. In order to join the panel at the upper right um, part of your screen, you have to ask to share audio and video or something like this. So if you could please do this, then we can also let you in, and then we have the panel complete. I'll just wait a second. And in the meantime, I can already start sharing screen. Okay, we still okay. as we are short on time, I will proceed in introducing the panel and then hopefully it will be complete by the time we'll start with the first question for the panel. So um, after we've already heard some great examples on how uh, a pan-European cycling network can be developed, what has been done in different national countries. We now have a panel of three experts to discuss, okay, what are ways to actually accelerate cycling network development? First up, we have Konstantinos Alexopoulos, who is the Chief of Transport Facilitation and Economics of the Sustainable Transport Division of the UNECE. He first joined the UNEC in 2007 after having a 10 years career in the private sector, servicing different senior positions in the logistics and transportation industry. Then we have Jill Wong, who is the CEO of the European Cyclists Federation, ECF. Her mission is to promote cycling as a sustainable and healthy means of transport and leisure and to advocate for the policies and funding that will increase cycling levels and make cycling safer and more accessible for everybody. Last but not least, we have uh, Bob Magavishis, who is the Executive Vice President of Specialized Bicycle Components, a US-based importer, distributor, and manufacturer of bicycles and accessories. He's worked for the bicycle industry for the past 35 years, and for the past 25 years, he's been an integral part to the global growth at Specialized. And next to his role at Specialized, he's also very active in the advocacy work of People for Bikes, the American Industry Association, as well as WBA, the World Bicycle Industry Association. So it's a great resource to give an overview on how the global bicycle industry is developing right now. So without further ado, I will hand over to Lukas, who will pose the first question to the panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Anna, and thank you, Ed, before for uh, moderating us uh, through this side event to the, to the, to the panel. Um, I, uh, yes. Bob is also coming on the screen. Thank you. So, um, yes, we had an um, interesting session until now. We have uh, heard some good practice from the countries. Also, Anna before spoke about some good practice in the countries. We have done some work as we have presented it to, um, um, to develop to, or to, to, to establish or to work towards establishment of the pan-European um, network. Now, of course, um, we are not there yet, as you could as you could see. So the first question I have to the to the panelists is, what would you see as a basis for an accelerated development of a cycling infrastructure in the pan European in the pan European region? You have seen we have still quite some gaps on that on that on that map that 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 Ed was was showing when I had some some technical technical issues. So maybe I start with. So what do you see as a basis for this accelerated development? Mm -hmm. 
Well, obviously, money and money and funding is important because it costs money to build cycle networks. But that's not enough. We also need a vision. We need clear national legislation, policies, and technical know-how. And you know, all of that goes together with courage and political will from our leaders to make sure that this is going to happen and that it's a priority. Um, I think that's that's important. If I could say a couple of more things about that, I think that um, what I said about uh, national legislations, I think some countries uh, might be missing some of the legal tools for implementing the optimal solutions for a given place. Uh, you know, can they allow, for example, contraflow cycling? in a, a local one-way street um, or are they able to acquire land for the construction of a cycle track in a more rural area these are uh, things that are important and the know-how um, we need to have the good know-how to make sure that that cycle infrastructure is fit for purpose that it is um, coherent safe attractive and comfortable for people to use and I think at the at the EU level, something we're um, happy about is thanks to the lobbying work we did the last couple of years, the um, in the road infrastructure safety management directive um, overhaul, the European Commission has been obliged to develop EU level quality requirements for walking and cycling infrastructure. And uh, we're expecting the call for experts for this working group um, to be announced very soon. Th thank you, Jill. That's 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 very, very interesting. Keywords, vision national legislation, know-how at the EU, even some, some, some uh, um, certain requirements. So with these keywords, Bob, as a representative of a private sector, what would you see as the, as the basis so that we can develop with an accelerated pace the cycling infrastructure network? So, so, so first of all, I'd like to uh, say that I'm really humbled just to see all the amazing investments in uh, in a, a product that we at Specialized work so hard to just make available and make safe for everyone. So I, I just want to thank everybody for that attention to detail and the wonderful efforts that everybody's putting into it. So. As far as a basis for accelerated development, you know, the, I have five points. Um, the first one is really the rapid adaptation of e-bikes for transportation, utility, recreation, and tourism. And, and that's really, uh, that's uh, stimulating a lot of interest. Uh, the second point is protected infrastructure does inspire confidence for safe use. And I think that's an important point for people. We need people to feel and believe that they're safe. Um, you know, cycling and building cycling in infrastructure is, is really a long-term outlook for climate control. And that's become something that all of us around the world are interested in. Um, bicycles and e-bikes are a simple median for becoming carbon neutral. And we all know that, and we're all in that business. And uh, lastly, cycling is the foundation for emission-free and sustainable transport. So I think that all of those bundled together are really the basis for accelerated development and the need for continued development of cycling infrastructure. So thank you for that. Thank you, Bob. Yes, people need uh, uh, to feel safe. Without that, possibly they would not want to use any type of infrastructure. Costa, all the experience uh, in your work at UNECE that you have, um, what do you see as the as the as the basis for this accelerated development of cycling infrastructure? Thanks very much, Lucas, and uh, and thanks everybody. I'm actually first of all I want to make a comment that I'm really happy to be with you, and uh, I was participating from the very beginning in the preparation of this master plan like five years ago, and I'm really happy to see also Robert Taller there, my real friend. Now. To me, I will reply to you as a, uh, regarding the UN approach, because for us, pan-European, actually, I, want, I should say, and I should mention that includes 56 countries and includes Russia, Caucasus, Central Asia countries, also Canada and, and United States. So in that sense, uh, to me, it's more like 
if you wish, like uh, the chicken and the egg again question, is about demand and supply um, and on how to accelerate development. Um, it is a matter, first of all, of policy and political decision. If a city will decide to promote uh, cycling instead of using the cars, um, then it will invest to construct a cycling network and not parking spaces for cars, let's say. It will make sure that we provide access to all its citizens to a combined public transport network with a walking distance of no more than 15 minutes for each mean of public transport. It will make uh, sure that uh, I can take my bicycle with me and I can safely park it, having space to bring it with me inside the tram, the underground, etc. So in that sense, if you wish, I believe there are uh, four major issues here. The first of all, it's the cultural issues, uh, uh, creating awareness, and I'm talking about the pan-European level, so we're not, not, not talking about only Netherlands and Belgium, which is the obvious, the uh, awareness is there, obviously, but I'm talking about all the countries in total. The, safe, the second thing is safety, obviously. I have to feel safe when I'm taking my bicycle to, to go with it. If I feel that any threat can exist because of many reasons, okay, I will not take it for sure. The third one for me, for us in UN, is accessibility. I think it's very important to have easy access to everything, including combined public transport. And the last one is comfort. Um, uh, cycling, especially inside the cities, should be a nice experience as it is while we're cycling in the countryside. So this is from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Kostas. I think there is quite some agreement uh, between, between the panelists. Uh, even though that was that was all presented from a different angles and with 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 different words, I'm of course very happy to to also hear from you certain words that 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 when we presented at the beginning, uh, uh, where are we and what we are working on, that we also thought these were the keywords. Um, so safety, safety and comfort of the cyclists when when using the future pan-European cycling network. Anna, over to you. Thank you. So now after the first question, we discussed a bit of the basis and the drivers of the Pan-European Cycling Network. We want to move towards the challenges. So what challenges do you see in the work aimed at the development of the Pan-European Cycling Network? Can this work perhaps benefit from past experience in creating other infrastructure networks? And I saw we already had some questions about actually the minimum design standards, how we can implement this. So. I would be interested to hear your views on this. You already approached it a bit, but let me know what are the challenges and how can we also tackle them with best practices. Um, over to Costas first. But um, you know, I was thinking um, when I when Lucas sent me the link, and uh, I tried to use the link, I was actually a bit lost because I couldn't see how it works with this new system, and uh, I couldn't find the button to, to, to turn on my, my video and my camera, my camera and my microphone. I'm saying this because you see, even a single thing using an online platform, if it's not harmonized immediately in the beginning, even for five minutes, we're lost. So to me, the most important thing here is the word harmonization. You know, in 1945, when the countries decided to create UNEC here in Geneva, the reason was to construct Europe again. And they gave us the mandate and we prepare for uh, infrastructure agreements, which I had the pleasure with uh, and the honor, of course, with Lucas to administer them. The, the road infrastructure agreement, the rail infrastructure agreement, the combined transport infrastructure agreement and the inland waterways infrastructure agreement, AGC, AGTC, etc., etc. All of you, you know the agreements very well, not only because these are the agreements that actually constructed Europe, but also because when you go to the European roads, European highways, you can see the E roads, E69, E55, the green um, plate. This is the UN agreements, because many, they, I hear them saying that, oh, this is EU. No, these are UN agreements, United Nations Agreement Infrastructure Agreements. In these agreements, there is not only the, um, if you wish, uh, the numbering, which is very important in order to have a full network number, et cetera, and very crystal clear, so all the main arteries are being identified, but also, which is very important, what was agreed with the governments, that's why they became also contracting parties and they implemented these agreements, it was the international minimum um, technical specifications. So the governments, by uh, acceding to these conventions, to these agreements, the UN agreements, okay, first of all, they agreed on the international minimum technical specifications. My opinion and experience is that you cannot have more than the minimum because they cannot agree otherwise. 
let's put it very clearly. So we need, however, to have some minimum technical specifications where the governments agree. You have a second part, terminology, termini um, uh, uh, definitions, okay, what you really mean, and the governments agree on that. So it's very important that the governments agree and it is part of the agreement of the convention. And the last point is the network itself. Um, so actually, in the actual agreement, and it is part of the agreement, it is in the body of the agreement, the network of the country. So then the country gives the network and updates this network in the agreement. So the other countries knows what is the network of my neighbor and what are the names they are using. And this helps a lot, especially in cases where we have problems with border crossing names, et cetera, et cetera. So practically, an international agreement, if you wish, like that, an infrastructure agreement includes all these elements. And I believe that the cycling, a cycling infrastructure agreement should be a, a great opportunity here because it will bring harmonization. It will set the international uh, minimum technical specifications and also it will set the, the, the network, the cycle network that the governments want to have. I think this is very important. So one last comment, sorry, Anna, for taking this, but the, the master plan that we have done, okay, already, it is a huge step towards this direction. It's a great step and it's a good practice. This is the way it has been done all these years from all other projects, at least with our experience in UN. Thank you very much. As I said, I think it's a good start, a good basis. And this is really we are on the way towards more harmonization to make sure we understand what we're talking about. So especially like the aspect about terminology to really know when we're talking about something that we also already really understand each other, what we mean. Um, so next up, Bob, what are your, uh, what do you think, what are some of the challenges that we will have to tackle here? Well, well thank you, Anna. Uh, you know, I think there are a, a, a few challenges. Uh, the, the first one I see particularly in the work uh, aimed at developing the network is that there needs to be a shared vision and there needs to be alignment between the EU member states. I think that's a that's a key point. Um, and I think also as the as we look at this the pan European development there are economic and and geographic diversity between countries and between people and i think that too needs to be carefully evaluated and understood as the eu moves forward in, with the cycling net, network and i would also like to make sure that there's consideration given to the versatility that now e-bikes bring to the mix. And there hasn't been a lot of talk about e-bikes, but e-bikes are an innovation that really provides versatility that allows people and riders to comfortably and safely conquer hilly terrain, rugged areas, and it provides a great framework and an effort for long distance and touring that uh, really have an important uh, role within the cycling community. And, and, and lastly is um, the, the challenges I think are to develop access for digital and analog bikes for leisure, recreation and sport riding. And I know that uh, Nicholas talked about that in Hungary, but I, I do think that there needs to be also a perspective that, uh, that digital and analog bikes are used for recreation and leisure and sport riding. And it's becoming something that has really evolved out of the pandemic. And, and the last question is, uh, can this work benefit from past experience in creating infrastructure networks? The answer is yes. And you know, it, and and I, I'm familiar with the the saying that says everything starts with an idea. And an idea without execution is just a dream. So the message really on what we can learn is say what you're going to do and do what you're going to say and that's my message for everyone 
So thank you again for that. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I think it's important. I mean, we're talking very big words. We have this big vision. Now we need to make sure that we actually use the momentum to move forward while also taking into consideration the diversities we have across the pan-European region, though. Um, so now moving towards Jill, especially talking about uh, with managing the Eurovillo or just from the cyclist perspective, what do you think are the challenges? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Annalena. Um, I would fully agree with Bob on what he said about e-bikes. Um, one great way to explain it that my colleague likes to likes to say is that it's like having a superpower when you're on an e-bike, and I can <laughs> I can totally um, agree with that. Uh, that's what I felt like the first time I rode one. Um, so, what challenges? I think one challenge with a pan-European network is that many countries don't even have a national coordination of their cycle network development. And that, of course, poses challenges when we're talking about a big uh, project like this. Um, we do have many experiences with developing the Eurovelo European cycle route network. It started with a bold idea. Countries and regions all over Europe voluntarily signed up to that, which was great, regardless of the current level of their development or political colors. And we've seen how this idea triggered development of national networks um, in the ensuing years. For example, in, in France, really great example. There's also the EU Trans-European Transport Network policy, which is currently under review. It's only logical that the upcoming revision integrates cycling as a fully fledged mode of transport and recognizes Eurovelo as one of the Trans-European Transport Networks. This would benefit not only EU member states, um, because uh, not only member states, because the, the 10T policy also allows for the funding of projects in the wider region. So I guess those are, are the things I would have to say about the challenges. Yeah, thank you. It's good, I mean, because we're still working and fighting kind of for a level playing field with other modes of transport. So I think that's a very interesting step forwards there. Uh, I'm not going to hand over Lukas to probably the last question. We'll see if we manage to get some panelist questions in there, but we're a bit tight on time. So over to Lukas. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So we spoke about the basis for accelerated uh, development. We tackled uh, various challenges. Um, well, we, we have a challenge that, uh, that has been with us for uh, quite some time now, and it's the COVID-19 pandemic. And I suppose in current times, we cannot uh, forget about, about, about the pandemic. So I wanted to ask you if uh, there are any lessons that, 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 that we are learning from the COVID-19 pandemic and whether there is something that we have to keep in mind from, from that pandemic that will also be important when we are working on the development of a cycling network. Bob, what do you say to that? Well, thank you, uh, Lucas, for, for uh, the question. And yeah, there are many lessons to be learned and I'll, I'll just highlight uh, a few here. You know, cycling not only survived in the pandemic, but it flourished. And, and, and that's uh, something that we all should cherish. Um, governments, and people around the world recognized cycling and bicycles as an essential business and an essential product. And this in itself is a really loud message about cycling's global importance. And we should never forget how important governments have recognized cycling as an essential business. Also, um, you know, what I think we can learn from it is that any investment in cycling is worthwhile. It will be acknowledged, used, and respected. Those responsible will be graciously remembered and rewarded for all they've delivered to this community and to the world. And, and lastly, uh, and lastly, what we have learned is that I think that it's important for everyone who's participating in this, whether it's governments or whether it's individual people, uh, cyclists, that we need to cooperate together with the cycling industry and the cycling community 
to ensure there's adequate supply and capacity to service the market needs. So, so there are my messages from uh, this COVID situation. So thank you, Lucas, and thank everyone for their uh, listening. Th thank you, Bob. Yes, your keyword, collaboration within the community. If there is no collaboration, possibly we cannot respond to the demands and also the various challenges. Jill, what do you say? Yeah, I'm going to share one lesson from the pandemic. Um, as a lot of you know, a lot of cities across the world introduced temporary pop-up cycling infrastructure to um, enable more cycling during the pandemic, whether to ease congestion on public transport or, or for other purposes. And research shows that this experiment, this living laboratory all over the world worked. So in 106 cities that were evaluated that had introduced such infrastructure, um, a recent research report showed that uh, cycling grew in those cities um, between 11 and 48 percent, statistically very significant numbers. If you build it, they will come. Very good. Costas, over to you. Your views on what do we need to take on board from the pandemic? Thanks, thanks, Lucas. Um, as you know, Lucas and, and colleagues are actually I'm dealing um, with border crossings uh, along uh, um, globally for UN, and uh, the challenges we faced with COVID was huge. Not though with bicycles. So I would I would I would like just to echo our colleagues, um, Jill and Bob, and actually um, I would like to to say that actually bicycles are an excellent mean of transport that prevents the virus spreading uh, while it's keeping us uh, um, uh, healthy and safe. This is for sure. And a well-designed cycling networks helps, uh, if you wish, to keep distance from each other while we are still using our preferable mean of transport uh, without uh, without uh, any interruption. Um, so I would say that since the question refers to COVID-19 uh, and the development of a cycling uh, network, I could mention the following. Um, first of all, um, the principles of safety and comfort that we discussed uh, in the first um, uh, question uh, are enough to create a COVID-19 free, I would say, cycling uh, network, meaning uh, with the appropriate distances, separate lanes, uh, not mixing, if you wish, pedestrians with cyclists, uh, cyclists with other cyclists and motorists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the second, um, I think, um, um, I, I think we all agree, it's automation and digitalization here. Um, and I think should be introduced uh, whatever needed and, and required, for instance, regarding access to parking spaces, uh, to activate traffic lights or whatever, ensuring that without touching actually uh, any, any infrastructure, you have access uh, everywhere. So these are my views on this. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating in, this, uh, in these discussions anyway. Thank you. Well, th 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 thank you, Costas, and uh, thank you to to all the all the panelists, Jill, uh, Bob, and 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 and, and Costas again. Um, it was um, very interesting to 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 hear your views. Thank you for your hints uh, when it comes to um, what should be the basis for accelerated development. Thank you for, to 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 pointing out the the challenges. And thank you also to 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 um, share your views on what do we need to take into account when when considering that 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 we live in a new world today with the with the pandemic. Um, yes, we are we are unfortunately coming uh, to the to the end of 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 of, of uh, this side event. Um, I think we unfortunately do not have the time to to be taking uh, uh, questions uh, uh, from the floor. At the same time. Having been looking at the chat, I, I hope that 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 we did cover the issues that were that were raised there, and uh, also thank you to 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 those that were also actively uh, responding to to the various questions um, that were that were that were raised. I think what's 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 uh, what's important, and I hope also that with this, I will I will. Uh, address certain concerns uh, mentioned by 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 colleagues so we at the UNECE we 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 are happy to take the leading role in developing of the of the pan european infrastructure network for cycling and in doing so we are very happy to work with our partners ECF Conevi um, WBIA 
Um, so it's, 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 it's our collaboration. And I think the, the force, the strength is in collaboration. Of course, we do um, have an open call to the countries, uh, countries uh, working uh, with us, countries attending the various working parties in the UNECE, especially the uh, working uh, party on transport trends and economics, under which we are doing this 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 work on 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 cycling. Um, of course, we are not able to do this work without the country. So uh, it's our open call to work with us. Um, I hope you do have our contact details. We need to work with you to collect the data. You have seen the map. Certain gaps are there, and the more east you go the more gaps there are. So we would, of course, want to fill uh, in that, that map with the, with the information on the planned or already available uh, cycling networks in your, in your countries. We, of course, um, very much look forward to work with you on whether it will be minimum um, requirements or definitions for certain elements. Alexander at the beginning mentioned that only we have only two definitions now in the international conventions in the 1968 uh, uh, Vienna conventions uh, uh, that on road traffic it's only about the cycle track uh, and, 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 and cycle path. There are so many more elements that have been developed in the countries and Alexandre again spoke that there are various uh, differences and the differences in understanding of all this compromises comfort, but more importantly, it compromises safety. Bob uh, stressed very that if the cyclists will not feel safe, they possibly will not want to cycle. Well, we need to do everything that people would want to cycle. So with this, I hope you will be happy to be working in the coming year with us so that maybe at the, at the, at the pan-European conference on cycling in a couple of years, we will be able to show to you a map that is, that is, that is actually without any, any gaps and that we will be able to show you what a pan-European network looks like. Thank you so much. And I do thank my, my colleagues from ECF and uh, Conebi WBIA for this excellent collaboration in preparing this. Uh, I hope you will agree me, with me, fruitful and excellent webinar. Thank you.